तो वेलकम टू द शो शेफ टी इट्स ग्रेट टू फाइनली हैव यू हियर आई बिन ट्रैकिंग यू डाउन फॉर आई डोंट नो हाउ मेनी मंथ्स बट यू आर हियर फाइनली सो वेलकम थैंक यू थैंक यू आई नो इट्स बिन अ लॉन्ग टाइम कमिंग एंड आई आई बिन लिसनिंग टू योर पॉडकास्ट फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम सो इट्स अ रियल प्लेजर टू बी हियर thank you so listen let's get right into it because i know i'm very very curious and we've had conversations about what you're up to with the local war um you know at at different points and i know those conversations went on and on and i was like okay i think we need to we need to record some of this so uh, we're finally here um you know i'm just going to take a step back to before you uh, you know you you launched uh, the local war and a little bit about your your journey up to this point which seems to uh have been filled with a few of these aha moments you know uh after you i think graduated you were traveling around europe for a while and that's when you'd been cooking european food but then you had this um sort of you know moment where you realized that you wanted to be doing indian food and i you know take us through that and then again now um post your canteen journey now doing something very very different but obviously in the same space so tell us what's been inspiring you at these various junctures that makes you kind of divert a little bit from what you're doing so i have always been someone who uh, is very receptive to being inspired um i'm i'm always uh waiting for ideas and inspiration to come to me and uh i've also been very driven as an individual ever since i was a little kid so um for me actually like when you when you ask me that question like i can go back to points in my childhood where in little ways i've had aha moments tell us <laughs> um like i mean i was maybe around 10 or 11 and uh, this that this actually connects back to where i am at today i was uh, 10 or 11 and my uh, dad bought a camcorder which uh, didn't end up getting used and it was just sitting on the wayside and i picked it up and i was like wait a minute i can i can so see you were on content. instagram before <laughs> instagram happened <laughs> yeah this was uh, like 25 years ago yeah. and uh, i started doing storytelling in my own way and and i was i was doing skits and magic shows and things like that and i was i i, I found this medium of expression uh and i was this odd kid growing up like i i, I didn't play sports uh i did well in school but i wasn't very social so um i always like felt like i was the odd kid i didn't realize that i was actually had a lot of creative energy which i was looking at different ways to expand um and uh, so at different points in my life i've had that and for me one of the biggest turning points happened uh on this food trip through europe I took a sabbatical which itself was a bold move for four months traveling across 36 towns and cities in France Italy and Spain and my biggest takeaway and it was an epiphany and I've had I've the for- good fortune of having many epiphanies in my life uh, I realized that um, I mean here I was spending all my life savings all my time and energy trying to learn a western uh, cuisine when I'd really not done the same in India and I know that I come from a country which has a very rich heritage and that that dissonance made me want to go back to India come back to India and kind of dig a little deeper and I was restless and that was serendipitously the same time that Samir Yash and Chef Floyd were looking for a partner uh, so um that was that first moment and ever since I mean I I got the job running the uh, kitchen at the bombay canteen as soon as i got the job i realized i know nothing about indian food i was about to uh, ask <laughs> that you know how did you kind of train or train yourself to kind of switch that palate and uh... so in a way i think again i was uh, in 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 a favorable position because i didn't come with any preconceived notions about indian food i had never been t- trained professionally it's only the food i grew up eating so i said i need to travel again and i took a f- two month trip across india uh, this time across 18 different places all the way up north to himachal down south to tamil nadu i went to the northeast i was in gujarat so covered but what uh, were you doing on these trips like so and this was again when i coined chef on the yeah. road which was approaching food uh, travel from a chef's perspective trying to understand uh a sense of the cuisine of the place but also getting to know ingredients techniques listening to the stories getting inspired and taking some of those ideas back to the bombay canteen uh, to put on a menu and um, and as soon as i did that first trip i i mean i was blown away that is my second major epiphany on that journey where i realized i mean 
India is so incredibly rich and diverse and none of that is making its way into uh, restaurants, restaurants yeah. or even in conversations or narratives around Indian food. So for me, that kind of like, it's almost like I found my purpose uh, right then and there. Uh, I wanted to kind of be a storyteller for Indian food in a lot of ways and uh, did that through the prism of the Bombay Canteen for about seven years. And I continue to travel. I've now... Uh, travel to about 25 states and union territories in India for food exploration wow. uh, in the last eight years. Um, and I think it's an incredible way to kind of explore and uh, learn. Uh, I also believe in constantly evolving uh, and growing as an individual. So this is a great way for me to do that. The other, I mean, what, what led to the locovore is... Um, I think over the over those eight years of travel, I increasingly felt disconnected from these conversations that happened that I was experiencing during my travels because here I was uh, seeing, uh, meeting farmers, seeing where the food is coming from, and uh, that felt very uh, disjointed from what, you were what I was doing at the <clears throat> restaurant and and uh, the people I was feeding, and um, and again like. Everything felt very like, like almost like uh, there was a duality to it, which uh, I I felt very strongly against because um, we as a society today are more and more distance from where mm-hmm. our food comes from, who's growing it, what's going into it, uh, and some very deep deep seated issues within our food system, and uh, so I felt like. I was just like uh, watching from the by the wayside and not doing anything. And so I wanted to challenge myself again, push myself out of that comfort zone of just being a chef and see if I could do something about it. And so I just took that plunge. uh, And again, I left. I mean, a lot of people think that I was leaving the Bombay canteen, but I was actually leaving being a professional chef cooking uh, in a kitchen every day. We're going to talk a lot more about that, but um, I actually want to go back a little bit more as to what actually led you to take a four-month sabbatical in the first place when you, <laughs> when you did that. I mean, you know, was it burnout? Was it looking for inspiration or a bit of everything? Uh, no, I, I think I felt stagnant and I also felt um, really um, the sort of imposter syndrome at that point when I was cooking European food and I'd never been to Europe. Uh, there's something really odd about that. Like, how do you do justice to the cuisine or food of a place if you've not, you know, spent time in that region, like, taking it all in? And so that's where it came from. And I actually saved up a lot of money and used up all of it on that trip. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it seems like it was worth it. It was so. <laughs> worth it in a very different way that I did not plan, but, yeah, it was worth it. Um, You know, again, coming back to Chef on the Road, uh, you know, we've all followed that on Instagram and... Um, you know, love kind of traveling vicariously through through you. Uh, they say that the food of India changes every sort of 100 kilometers. Um, but I've actually heard both views where, <laughs> you know, uh, I think on this was on another, on, I was on some panel and um, somebody was talking about how that's not actually true and people want to eat those same comfort flavors across the country. And this was someone who has a QSR chain. <laughs> uh, and I was quite intrigued because I felt that I've heard both sides. What is your take on this? Um, depends on what kind of scale you're looking at. Uh, I mean, I think our food changes from home to home, for example. There's, there are different ways in which uh, we make dal. Yeah. Um, but I think if you're looking at it from like a more general level, um, the change is very... Um, very subtle Mm -hmm. so it does change say every 50 100 kilometers but it's not like you cross a border 50 kilometers and suddenly it's a new world that's not that's not what it is in india um imagine that we didn't have borders right and so as as you move away as you travel you see slight shifts in say the kind of spices that are used or with the landscape the kind of produce that's there so you'll see slight changes. Uh, so our cuisine is also, and and you'll see this with near borders within states mm. where there are similarities on both sides, and that's that kind of shift that's slowly being blurred. Blurred. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, and like for example if you look at odisha um, and the food of odisha near west bengal is very similar to bengali food but right. the food of odisha close to andhra pradesh is very similar to andhra, andhra yeah. food which nobody will think of odisha as having any, anything remotely close to andhra food but it does so uh, i don't know if that answers your question but no it does and i mean i've seen this uh, the other day i was i was at a party where they were serving dosa and the guy was explaining how the sambar is different he he was like this is a tamil nadu sambar and i was like what's <laughs> a tamil you know how is it different but i think that's the the point that you know the foundation might be um, at a base level you know there are uh, it, it is similar but there is the subtle differences that yeah i think the more pronounced differences uh, come from uh, either religious influence mm. uh caste influence class influence not from geography uh so uh a brahmin sambar would be very different from like a sambar of uh, a, a different caste mm. in terms of the ingredients used there might be like uh, ghee for example right. which is a more expensive rich man's ingredient, ingredient. Yeah. so um those differences are more pronounced because each of those communities is either uh trying to make a case for why their food is a certain way or it's out of necessity and what they have sure let's deep dive into the locavore a bit more um you know you've talked about what you were seeing and that that disconnect you were feeling but what problem really are you trying to solve here and tell us about you know what what it is so sure so um again like i said i i saw like so many uh, disjointed pieces within the food system and people see being so disconnected from um, what's happening at the grassroots level and um, at the same time i also saw organizations uh, like really amazing incredible uh, leaders who were doing incredible work behind the scenes who are trying to change the system who are trying to make interventions in the food system whether it's to do with um, inequality at the farm farmer level or farmer livelihoods or it's in terms of say inputs in our farms and pesticides and chemicals or or food packaging or um issues around mental health in the in the food system it could be any of those things but um there were actually people making intervention but it's all happening one behind the scenes they don't have uh, a large enough audience uh, they don't know how to amplify what amplify they're what they're saying or tell their stories in a powerful way um and they're all operating in silos uh, they're not talking to each other so i wanted the locavo to be a platform that kind of connects the dots that becomes a facilitator an enabler a catalyst to bring all these pieces together in a way um build a movement towards making these positive changes within the food system through storytelling through partnerships and collaborations with people like this through fun events through mm. travel experiences through uh, kickstarting projects centered around some of these issues um and so i'm trying to build a larger movement but starting small starting i was going to say easy. i mean india is so vast and you know you could probably not you know you could spend the next 5 years just covering maharashtra and you probably wouldn't yeah. even you know be able to uh, go deep enough how are you approaching this you know i mean it seems like a minefield so i mean i have this uh, existential problem in my business as well and when it's when i'm worrying about the small things i look at the bigger picture when i'm worrying about the bigger picture mm-hmm. and how vast it is and i look at the details uh, but uh, to answer your question i think uh, like i said i'm not trying to do everything i'm trying to find the people who connect. are already doing it and connect uh, amplify what they're doing, trying to do support them in some way if possible um get people to network it to, with each other and bring synergies out of it so like i'm my my goal is not to deep dive into like maharashtra and solve uh, maharashtra's food system issues my goal is to inspire people to do that my goal is to already find the people who are doing that and bring them to the forefront um and like i said there are and and that the percentage of the the people who are actually driving change in india in this field is only increasing mm-hmm. uh, we're already in some sort of a movement towards being better being in a better place so um so give us some examples of you know 
interesting things you've come across um, that you may not have known about before and uh, you've seen an impact happen because of what you're doing? Yeah, so we did something called the Wild Food Project um, over the la- over the monsoons this year. And um, again, for people who aren't aware, wild foods are anything that is not cultivated. Uh, you have restaurants like Noma who have made a killing uh, on, <laughs> on foraging and getting ingredients from the wild. But uh, the ironic part again with i mean i i it, it, it's so funny to me because there's so many young cooks who go to noma for uh, internships uh, and again most things that are at noma are centered around the idea of foraging from the wild but uh, right here in india we have like an incredible playground, uh, playground of wild food to do with. and the difference between what's happening uh, in copenhagen and here is that here, our wild foods have been consumed by tribal communities for thousands of years. There, it's new food. Uh, here, we have the traditional wisdom all around. It just needs to be tapped into. So, we did a wild food project to uh, focus on, again, forest foods in the Palgar district in Maharashtra in the monsoon. So, it's very specific. Um, and uh, a lot of the information has not really been documented very well. It's not archived. It's not uh, presented in a way where people can kind of uh, understand it. And so I got about 20 people together. um, And there's a mix of researchers, recipe testers, chefs like Chef Gresham, um, uh, illustrators, designers, all to come together and one create, we we created a like a wild food zine, which is practically like a book. Uh, a lot of people say this is not a zine. A zine is like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just a bunch of papers put together. But uh, we did a wild food festival with Triple O Farms. We did a wild food walk. And we're trying to get people excited by the idea of it, try to understand the nuances of it. Um, and uh, that is a start. And, and, and we're also working on translating that zine into Marathi to kind of give back to the community so that they have something to be proud of that they can hold on to because the next generation of, uh, these tribal communities is straying away mm. from uh, doing a lot of this but uh, yeah so these are little steps uh, along the way and again w- even with the producers that we've engaged with in different parts of the country um, there is um, a company called Forest Post in Kerala that's working with um, women in the Chalakudi river basin and uh, creating value added products from minor forest produce um, and and again, that's that's a sto- that's a lovely story. And these are all like really powerful stories that mm. you know you kind of want to immerse yourself into. Um, I'm telling you, that's kind of what happened. I just started <laughs> reading more and more, and it was. Um, but you know, I think uh, you you sort of um, talked about this about getting chefs involved, right? Now, to me, uh, again, going back, drawing the analogy with Noma, I think that's the key thing: is that someone who's who's presenting this in a way that. Uh, you know, the consumer finds uh, interesting or like they would have, but it's just not packaged in a way that mm-hmm. makes it, um, you know, exciting or, or uh, something to try, right? So I think that's where the, 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 there's possibly some disconnect between, you know, having all this gold available to us and not being able to use it uh, the way it should be in, you know, in food, etc. So how do you sort of see yourself kind of bridging that gap being a chef yourself um you know is it something that you feel uh restaurants should be bringing in you know how how do you see yourself kind of or what do you think can be done if not by you but just the community i think um again i think you hit the nail on the head when you said about how it's packaged and that's where i think i come in um and i've I've managed to do that in some way through the food of the Bombay canteen where we packaged Indian food in a way that people took notice, that Mm -hmm. people saw it very differently. Uh, Through the course of the seven years that I was there, we featured 160 local indigenous vegetables, which, I mean, like most uh, city dwellers in Bombay hadn't even tasted, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all local stuff. So, uh, So we got people to think differently about Indian food. And I think the same is true for the local war as well, where... What I'm trying to do is to get people to think differently about their food choices, um, you know, and package it in a way that it becomes almost irresistible for them to not 
do something about it. Um, I'm also trying to sell the idea of like deliciousness, right? Like, uh, and the, we've I mean, spoken about this. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It right? does come yeah. down to that. I mean, especially if you're privileged. Um, but uh, the idea that like you do, you want to eat a more diverse diet. You want to eat. I mean, a lot of these in- ingredients, a lot of these. Uh, say regional dishes they're all really really tasty but we just haven't had access to them we've not known how to kind of process them um so that's where i'm trying to intervene but how i mean again just digging a little deeper into this how can you give that access to people to the average consumer if there isn't say a restaurant doing this or um you know the food isn't available somehow locally to you how can this happen through again it's it's all that uh, quadrangle of storytelling which is our content it's events and experiences it's partnerships and collaborations and projects mm-hmm. through a lot of these the, some, some of this is online some of this is offline um, it's it's a lot of these moving pieces coming together where people have access to it i know that i saw this um, millet chicken biryani recipe on your website and trust me i can't cook everyone knows that <laughs> um and i'm least interested in it as well because it usually turns out really horrid um but i saw that and i was like i am going to get someone to cook it for me if not do it myself um but i i guess it is that right like putting it out there and you know people having access to this kind of information that may not have been there and that and, was... and you talk about like like someone like you struggling with the idea of cooking right and this is something that i Uh, with the first lockdown explored through this cooking with tzak series yeah. uh was that i think people are um intimidated by cooking without really understanding what it takes to do it and that's what i wanted to show through that series was that it's not actually that i that, know that, i almost got tempted i saw See? it <laughs> And I was almost, like, I almost I was like, got you there. She's just using a normal patila. There's no fancy equipment. Yeah. It's at home. It can't be that. Yeah, and what hard. I did was I also showed that you know, like even a chef like me with 15 years of experience, I make mistakes. I fumble, and I I showed all of it. I didn't edit it out. Yeah. Um, and I said, listen, you know, if if you don't have these two ingredients, it's okay. Still, like I think we're too rigid and too yeah, hard on ourselves. <laughs> yeah, like just like go with the flow. It's more about the act of cooking and feeding yourself and nourishing yourself and. and i think that that is what clicked i think people connected with that where okay i don't have to be a fancy chef to be able to cook for myself and um, i didn't even put up recipes like i went to like that entire series put up like some 50 60 70 recipes and n- no instructions no quantities but people still recreated those recipes because i wanted them to feel empowered mm-hmm. and that's what that did and, and so and use your intuition right yeah I mean, and use your yeah. intuition and so that was again like i mean you can apply that same analogy with the locovore as well where i'm trying to again nudge people and bring them into the conversation um and make them feel empowered to do take some of these calls absolutely you know speaking of um, sort of wild um wild foods right uh, i think one of the cool things about wild foods is that they're probably what we refer to as organic because they're wild and so no one's gone <laughs> about um you know uh blasting them with with pesticides and what not right so um let's let's talk a little bit about about this whole organic uh tag and um you know i think one of the things i understand that you're doing you're trying to do through the locavore is actually uh see whether this you know what's being labeled organic is truly organic um take us through that a little bit you know how would someone i mean i've seen through the lockdown obviously because there's this bigger focus on health um like so many brands suddenly mushroom calling themselves organic and doing home delivery of you know green baskets or um you know it could be flours atas whatever right like grains etc how does the consumer actually know whether this is legit or not and you know how do you uh verify that so um i mean the minute you say organic i, I usually have a big smile on my I face because that. i have <laughs> so much to say about it um i think see where the organic movement started uh came from a very genuine place uh it was actually a way of us going back to how we like grew grew our own food uh which is without chemicals without pesticides um but uh, what it has come to mean is completely different because it is um distilled down into a very 
um, monotonous way of farming. That's one. Secondly, organic certifications, especially in India, from everyone I've spoken to, is a joke. Because there's a lot of corruption. There's there are ways around it. It can uh, be bought. Basically. It can be bought. Uh, and thirdly, it's prohibitively expensive mm. for the small farmer. Um, when we talk about organic, I think we also need to address greenwashing. And mm-hmm. greenwashing is basically when companies use words like organic and natural and fresh and sustainable, sustainable to basically get you to buy their products where it's more lip service than anything else um what we are trying to do is to counter that with uh, a different approach um we have something on our website called the tl bite or the locovo bite where we break down a producers uh, or of or a food brands um practices uh, into a whole bunch of different criteria now when you think about sustainability and organic people often say, think of it as either black and white like either you're organic and you're good or you're you know not organic and you're bad but sustainability is actually a gray scale there's no nobody is 100% I think sustainable. sustainability is a very different concept for me because yes it is as far as the produce is concerned but it goes well beyond that right exactly yeah. and and nobody addresses that nobody understands that uh, and you always think of it as like an end goal which is it's not you cannot be 100% sustainable exactly it is literally impossible but you can be trying to get better and better in different aspects of what it means to be sustainable so we broken it down into different things like for example composition and input so like what goes into whether a company is actually uh, staying away from pesticides and chemicals we've gone and in, gone into workforce like i mean you can be an organic mm-hmm. company but like paying your workers peanuts is that is that mm-hmm. sustainable no it's not right uh, what 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 is the uh, uh revenue that's going back to the farmers who are growing your food uh we've brought in things like community are you doing something for the larger community around you we've spoken about source of origin do you know exactly can you verify exactly where your food is coming from so a lot of different parameters and we've not we've kind of done it in a very descriptive way um our assessment happens over the course of several months uh we have a team that works with the producers and tries to understand it uh we try and travel and uh, verify some of these things but that's that's the piece of the puzzle we're still working on but what what you i mean the credibility that an organic certification comes with uh me actually to me means less than us interacting with understanding building relationships with these producers um and then building on trust mm-hmm. uh building on a certain level of transparency with them um we often like I mean very often when we start uh deciding whether to pick a producer or not we it, it comes down to a lot of different parameters but at the end of the day me and my uh sourcing and partnership you know I mean she worked for you Takshma yeah, yeah. um it it comes sometimes comes down to gut and mm. and gut instinct because uh, I mean nobody can te- like prove to you 100% yeah. that somebody's like telling the truth or not but um but we develop relationships to to establish that and uh, then we kind of present that information in a way that people can kind of absorb the the our readers our audience can understand uh, so that they can make an informed decision so for you for example if it means that um a company that's fair trade and like do paying their workers well is what's important to you you see right. what this company is doing on that front and you support that but if someone else um it might be in the kind of farming practice that they're following um and um, and and we also then work with those producers to see if they can kind of uh, improve on on the parts of their sustainable metrics which need to be improved um we are soon working on building a producer community there are we have a network of about 15 16 producers now and um they all have a lot to bring to the table but they don't talk to each other mm. imagine the power of like bringing them on 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 the same table and getting them to speak to each other bring value to each other yeah no i mean there's so much to be done and uh i saw on your website again that you have a list of brands that um you know you you sort of i'm i'm saying this <laughs> word uh, very carefully but endorse in a way and uh, and i think that that's really helpful because it's just it sounds crazy that there isn't one place that 
calculates all of this, right? I mean, exactly. It just sounds really crazy that you, you can't. That there's no one repository for this kind That's of. That's exactly. But is this happening elsewhere in the world, and we are just kind of lagging no, behind, I mean, or is it not even happening? Not elsewhere? really. It's not really wow. happening. So, uh, you you won't believe this. The idea for the local came to me, um, like I just woke up with it one day. Yeah. Um, because as soon as I left the Bombay canteen, suddenly, I mean, uh, I'm always very uh, interested in how like creativity works. But as soon as I left the Bombay canteen, I listed down like potentially maybe ten, fifteen things that I'd like to get myself uh, working on. So one was obviously figuring out sourcing and supply chain for local ingredients. One would be creating a content platform, and one would be if can I get involved in uh, schools and colleges and doing stuff. And and I woke up with this idea of the Lokovo, and um, it was kind of an amalgamation of all of these coming together. And I was like, wait a minute, this doesn't exist. Yeah. How does this like? How is it possible that there's, it there's no so one place? Right it's, it's now. exactly. <laughs> you, but I'm glad that you you feel the same because you're the first person who's shared that uh, yeah. opinion where it says it's so obvious, but it doesn't exist. Yeah. Um. So I I think I kind of have an inkling why, and we'll talk about that <laughs> later. Okay. But um, you know, uh, coming back to this point of uh, you know, I think one of the things that I've seen uh in my sort of limited you know, uh, exposure to the spaces, uh, corporations and things. Like even previously, there was no, there were no corporations bringing farmers together because one of the key issues or challenges is logistics, right? The cold chain or the, or not the cold chain, but just logistics of getting all this amazing produce that's all over our country to cities like Bombay, etc., where it can then be, you know, used in um, restaurants, etc., right? Or even to people's homes. So, uh, is that something that you're seeing get we're getting better at as a country and you know hundred percent okay I mean I've seen that so I mean I've now I came back from New York in 2010 so I've been in India for 12 years I've seen that happen very uh, effectively over the last uh, especially five six years a lot of these solutions in India exist it's just that we're not either we're not activating them or there's not enough demand for it to be uh, activated. So, um, I mean, like at the Bombay Canteen, for example, it was easier for me to get truffles than it was to get, <laughs> say, Naga chilies, for, right? That's Which was crazy. absurd. Yeah. But it's not that, I mean, like, and we hired someone to solve that for us and she figured it, figured it out, like, mm. overnight. Um, so it's not that it's not, not possible, it's just that there's no demand for it. Mm. Um, so that has definitely changed. We don't, like, we today we have 10-minute Swiggy deliveries, right? Like, um, we've, lo- the logistics part is the easy part. Uh, the challenging part is getting people to think differently about it mm-hmm. because we constantly um, sold the other side of the story. We constantly sold convenience. We constantly sold the idea of not having to think about it and just, like, just, just, push the button or click Easy and access, buy yeah. um, without having to think about the fact that okay maybe I should figure out where my food is coming yeah. from so that's what that's what I'm fighting and that's so that's at the demand side the other thing is trends right so I hate that word with a vengeance <laughs> but I get asked this every December right about the upcoming trends and I'm like I have no clue um I remember millet became this crazy trend like what was behind that you know is this some kind of uh weird PR mechanism going on behind the you know someone who's growing it or how did that happen? I'll before I get into millets, I also want to like express my <laughs> go angst on go for, for it. angst <laughs> for trends because uh, I th- I mean I I think I mean this is a humble plea to all food journalists everywhere in India. Can we stop asking what the next year's trends are? Thank you. Because none of us can predict the future. <laughs> what I'd like to maybe. Uh, be asked is what do you think will still remain the same yeah you know I always say that actually I'm like you know trends are fleeting by definition right and I'm hoping that whatever we do isn't <laughs> gonna be fleeting and is there for the long haul so and um, my answer every year is the same I mean because I'm always like I'm okay I'm gonna be hopeful and say uh, you know some Indian yeah. food uh, movement of sorts takes takes shape anyway so getting back to millets I think uh your question has come at a very ripe time because um, 
next year is the international year of millets and the indian government has kind of uh, gotten the un to recognize it as the international year of millets so there's going to be a lot more talk about millets next year interesting <laughs> i did not know that this was not why i asked it but that's very good um, to know but um, millets are actually a very important subject uh, food subject today uh, for many reasons but primarily to do with climate change uh millets are a climate resilient crop they don't require a lot of water they don't require a lot of inputs um they are part of our food heritage and our, our traditional food cuisine for like millennia um and yet i mean what happened primarily through like the green revolution in the 70s was the government started like focusing on things like rice and mm-hmm. wheat so people stopped growing millets uh mm-hmm. it's not something that's um uh, encouraged or rewarded um but um things like rice and wheat are very um like l- not just labor intensive but also uh, resource intensive uh, yeah. crops um so that's that's that two they're highly highly nutritious i know we were both part of the quinoa trend <laughs> where uh, this this <laughs> well, i have to call it out i'm sorry uh, i did this as well i did this as well i had a quinoa salad on my menu at uh, Uh, at a restaurant in bombay uh, 10 years ago um and l- look at what happened uh, a south american grain started getting grown in india by farmers mm. right um but and that is because it was touted to be nutritious and like a super food and things like that millets are the same mm. uh, and practically every part of the country has some version of millets whether it's major or minor and there are different types of it it's just that it's i mean it's a little harder to cook it's not as straightforward as rice it takes rice. longer right it takes yeah. longer uh it's not a it's not a um, taste or texture that we're used to so you have to kind of wrap your head around that re- as well re rewire your sort re- of rewire yeah. your, uh you know flavor um appreciation and um that's that's all there is to it but i mean there is some uh, merit to exploring millets uh, there's a lot of merit to exploring millets and there are again like i said organizations doing incredible work there's i mean odisha has uh, something called the odisha millet mission which is getting farmers to switch to uh, naturally millet. grown millets um, and they've made significant headway uh, we at the lokovor are actively exploring um, a millet revival project as what we do next year so a larger long term maybe uh, at start of uh, like almost like a one year project where we activate people across the spectrum from policy level to wow. uh, schools and colleges to restaurants and chefs to at the farmer level um and see if we can uh, drive change amazing you know talking about getting farmers to start growing it again i mean um i think one of the the key um challenges is that is it really uh sustainable for them right so of course it's a demand supply thing but just even the whole going back to that conversation about organic and um what i like to call chemical free right so it's not about being organic and getting that certification but uh is it is is it is it a challenge for them to be uh profitable enough and how do we kind of tackle that bit of it uh it is a very complex um subject because i think at at the at the core level the system is not designed to encourage farmers to grow food more sustainably uh i'll give you a, an example um one of the things get subsidized a lot in india is fertilizers and pesticides and it's actually not the farmers who get those subsidies it's the companies mm-hmm. that make the fertilizers and pesticides um i told you things like rice and wheat so farmers are encouraged to grow the same crop on the same land year after year which is also not good for the soil um so i think i mean everything is stacked up against farmers um they they don't get to make a lot of these choices mm. uh they are the mercy of policies i was going to say it seems like a lot has to happen at the policy level yeah at the policy level but sometimes i mean policy can be driven by uh consumers mm. can be driven by organizations uh like i said i mean um the odisha millet mission was uh a policy level change that happened with a bunch of people who just started working on working with some farmers and the government took took initiative and like 
took it supported on it. and supported <coughs> it uh, and they put like close to 3000 crores into that initiative coming to restaurants because obviously that you have vast experience with um it's the same question i have is that you know how uh, how practical is it for restaurants to be sustainable and profitable <laughs> I know you love this question. Why have you heard me ask <laughs> yes. this? Yes, <laughs> a million times. Ask, address, uh, talk about. Um, I want your point. Because of I feel like you, like you, innately want to do it, but uh, there's something like constantly holding you back. Um, uh, I think one we have to first break down what sustainability means to you. Um, you know, uh, I think, for example, having a great workplace where people. Um, but i mean world mental health day is coming up in 8 days do you have a workplace which is uh, you know positive and nurturing that's that's one way to be sustainable um we often look at sustainable as saying okay you are serving only organic produce okay then then you're sustainable or you have um, you you're using your orange rinds <laughs> yeah or <laughs> or you're not using plastic uh, yeah Uh, it's at a very superficial level it's at a very yeah. superficial level so and that's typically because companies try to uh, restaurants try to do it for lip service um a lot of sustainable sustainability initiatives can actually save you money you talk about food waste right uh, i'll i'll i don't know if you've done this but at your restaurants just follow the simple exercise get it's a little bit of an investment get one of your staff to stand and weigh all the food waste is coming back okay on so a day to day you mean like unfinished food unfinished food on from the table on people's plates Hopefully and there isn't that much of that going on but yeah no fair and and, then, and also the food waste not i'm not talking about trimmings maybe even trimmings but the the stuff that's getting wasted just weigh your waste so what can you do for start with weighing okay. it the figures will blow your mind mm. okay uh, i mean At, at at the Bombay canteen um we we did this experiment and and it was absurd um you can do things there, there are reduce i mean the solution, portions you, maybe, you reduce yeah. portions you encourage people to eat differently uh or eat, to order or less even when they order exactly or even when they yeah. order we encourage that but i mean that 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 is money mm-hmm. that's going into the dustbin right for you as a business um i mean and the consumer and the <laughs> consumer yeah uh sourcing locally um i mean you're going to save money if you so figure out local ways to source so i think again we we have a very uh like one dimensional view of approaching sustainability but i think looking at it holistically looking at the various parts to it uh, is important and it's not i mean i, I think equating being more sustainable being more uh, costly is 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 not accurate fair um that's definitely some food for thought <laughs> pardon the pun but uh, and, and i know and we could do a whole different show an uh, episode on just talking about we, this and we can yeah. talk separately of of uh mike and I no mean, I, i think I'm, we I'm should do to... another actually i feel like we should do almost like a masterclass in ways to think about it because say for example what you just talked about even mental health no one really associates that with sustainability but you know what's really interesting is that um so earlier this year when we uh we um were uh, put on this asia's 50 best list they introduced this sustainability award and uh, that's actually how we found out we won the list we we missed the email which told us we won the list and then they sent us this things that since you're on it would you also like to um would you also like to participate in this and we were like what are you talking about but anyway um that's for another day but this uh this nomination that came this form it had apps exactly this and we were like not even an iota sort of prepared to yeah. uh you know um qualify for this but what i did do is i kind of um downloaded and screenshotted or whatever the the entire thing because i was like oh my god these are all the things exactly. that they're talking about and uh you know it's whether it's for this award or not like these are what we need to be incorporating into our um you know organization which uh, it just gives us all those levers that we need to be looking at yeah. and uh, we never ever thought about this as um as part of sustainability because it is a very myopic concept in terms of literally food waste and you know um reusing as much and using reusable 
uh, products, etc. So I, I think that um, I definitely feel like it's worth breaking this down for people where, you know, you don't have to be 100% sustainable. It's probably not viable. Yeah. But you just have to start with what can be done. Yeah, and what works for you. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, like I'll give you an example. At, at the Bombay Canteen, um, for me, I've, I've worked in some abusive kitchens and I, I it was very important for me to change that. Uh, but not just change that, but also we always think of restaurants as having... Uh, like you're working long hours, it's really stressful mm-hmm. environment. So it's not just the stress and the the abuse that you take, but it's also uh, no sense of like balance in your in the rest of your life, in your social life, in your family life. So I know we, you guys were one of the first to do uh, a five day eight work day, week. yeah, like an eight day eight eight monthly offs, and yeah, we were and, like, and yeah. and um, you won't believe it, like people stopped. Quit like we, we didn't mm. have we re, the retention went, uh, went, higher, uh, went yeah. much higher. People are happier, food improved. So if you look at like when you think about making these changes, if you look at the smaller picture, if you look at what's on paper, it you might seem cost, like yeah. this cost. But I can guarantee you, it'll only help your business. Right. Yeah. No, I think we we definitely <laughs> need to do this separate episode, uh, follow up episode. Um, you know, speaking about profitability, let's talk about the business aspect of what you're trying to build here, right? Um, you know, that's a it's a big plunge you took, uh, very different from a sort of hopefully well paid, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, stable career that you were you know you were following all this time. Um, how did you? You know, how are you approaching this from a business perspective? You've moved from being, you know, uh, I think this is probably probably your first real entrepreneurial stint. And uh, what's that been like? It's actually been, I mean, it's actually been amazing. Um, I think I was, uh, I've always had that, I've always enjoyed being a leader, being an entrepreneur in some way. Um, but... Um, if you're talking about how I'm approaching the locovo as a business, um, at this point, I'm looking on building it. I'm looking on uh, establishing uh, a sense of what we're trying to do. Uh, like even for you, we needed to have this conversation mm-hmm. on this podcast for you to really understand what I'm trying to do. And I'm, and I'm glad that you did because this is a way for more people to understand what we're trying to do. Um, we're also in a very exploratory phase where there are a lot of great opportunities and collaboration that are coming to us, which uh, is bringing us a lot of learning. Um, there are many different revenue streams, streams I've identified, which I can kind of explore uh, actively, but um, I'm not doubling down on any of them right now because I think it's too soon. Um, I can monetize storytelling. I can monetize... Um, say specific projects which I take up for people I can monetize CSR I can monetize consultancies um, I definitely can monetize events um, I've been pondering turning Chef on the Road into curated travel experiences where we tie in all of these different parts where we tie in farms and producers and things like that uh, so there are a lot of different ways it can go down but I think it's too soon to do that uh, right now I'm enjoying the process Um uh, I am a solo founder. This is all self-funded. Uh, this wow. is pretty much bootstrapped. Um, I have a small but amazing team of people who, uh, and we're really like driven and passionate and loving what we're doing. And I mean, the kind of like people have, who have come forth and like wanted to work with us in different ways, uh, some of which you we haven't put out there yet. Is it's just like really heartwarming and special and. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about the local was that at our very core, we are about uh, impact. Uh, yeah. So in everything we do, whether it's the storytelling, whether it's uh, our collaborations, our projects, uh, we it, it's the impact that drives us. Uh, and um, so I think we have our north star, and we're working towards it. And I'll figure I'll figure the money piece out. I'm uh, sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean you're absolutely right. There's you know it's very important to establish um, the brand in a way and what you're actually trying to do and and have case studies of of success yeah. before you start uh, you know trying to 
make money of it but you know i have no doubt you'll you'll do it very <laughs> successfully um and i know you've worked with brands in the past before you started the local war and uh i have to ask you about this one thing which uh, again has come up a lot <laughs> on my shows where uh, i have someone from the food space so um you know you've worked with uh, plant based meat brands what's yeah. your take on this product uh, as a new avatar of vegetarianism Before I get specifically into plant based, I just want to briefly address the whole vegetarian vegan movement, and I think because that's where it starts, right? Like, I mean, it's an uh, plant based meat is an offshoot of the right. vegetarian or vegan yeah. movement, and I think the problem with that is that it's always been in extremes. Um, I mean, you it basically you can't go around um, telling everyone to stop eating meat and seafood without taking into context the uh, people in the communities in 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 that space mm-hmm. um now in india especially specifically there are like lakhs and lakhs of people who depend on meat and seafood for their sustenance it's mm-hmm. their livelihood there are communities which depend on meat and seafood for their nutrition right you can't just say okay stop eating this um it's 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 a very again comes from a point of privilege where you if you if you telling people to do that um i think if you're talking about people in the cities and people who are privileged yes we can do something to cut down on 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 our meat consumption um my other qualm with plant based meats is that it's totally sidelining a whole world of really amazing diverse vegetables that we have um and boiling it down into uh a substitute which again for me is problematic in some ways um i mean there are arguments against it about it being resource intensive which nobody is mm-hmm. talking about um but otherwise i think it's i think it's uh, still too early to tell um i don't think um india's in any any time in the near future going to be a country that's going to be uh shifting to shifting it, yeah. to plant based meats um i used to get journalists to ask me at the bombay canteen like what are the vegan dishes on your menu and what are the you know and i mention all the vegetarian dishes that we have because india has a lot mm. of vegetarian dishes and they like no no but what is your, and but i'm like no but like these are my yeah. vegetarian dishes like why do we have to find uh, a cashew curd dish when there are dishes that don't have yeah. uh, any uh, dairy in them right so um i'm not against plant based meats i'm just saying that the way uh, we approach it is flawed mm. um i think i've had plant based meats which are really delicious um and again you see, you have a lot of companies coming up in india but let's not forget that uh, i mean there are like eat vegetables eat yeah. eat eat delicious local vegetables um and we have so many of those eat locally eat seasonally we stop doing that go to your markets and buy what's around you yeah no absolutely what can the listeners look forward to by way of experiences coming up um we have a lot coming up um we have uh, some interesting associations with festivals uh, where there are going to be food components um more travel um we'll do events here and there there'll be collaborations in different forms um like i said the last time we did a project the wild food project uh, our audience could get engaged and work with us and a lot of them did and it was really special we're going to have a lot more of those so uh, that's my way of building communities where people can actually engage and work with uh parts of the loco which they feel strongly about uh so there's a lot coming there's obviously going to be storytelling uh around different topics in the food industry happening constantly that people can engage with um and um, if if anybody has any ideas that they want to explore we are very open as well uh, i've i've built the local world to be very collaborative mm-hmm. in nature so um we're all yours and uh, we're also kind of learning along the way well, hopefully we can get you to cook in max street maybe <laughs> one day and uh, you know showcase some of this amazing produce that you are discovering every day. Um we're going to take a quick break before we enter the last segment of the show which is the rapid fire. So stay with us.
Welcome back uh, to this round is on me and I have Chef Thomas Zacharias with me and uh, we've been talking all things yummy um, but this time I'm going to ask you what is your go-to comfort food? Uh, strangely enough it's chaat oh, which is strange yeah. because um, I think my first chaat experience was only when I was 18 uh, but I, I can eat. Is chaat a big thing in Kerala? No, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. So uh, but I, I can eat any and all kinds of chart and like copious amounts of it. Very cool. Um, so I usually ask my guests about a great book they're reading or a podcast they're listening to. Um, and But I'm going to ask you, what's the cookbook that's open on your kitchen table right now? Um, I'm it, I'm going to give you a, like a bummer of an answer because I don't refer to a lot of cookbooks. Um, well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I will mention uh, a book that I'm reading, which is uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Mm-hmm. Um, the purpose behind. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think uh, his his talks and his, his work has really inspired uh, where I'm at currently in my journey. Very interesting. Um, what would you say is the best investment you've made in your journey so far? Travel. I've I've spent a lot of uh, time, effort, and money on my travel, and it's it's been incredible to uh, take in all the learnings that have come from people from places along the way. It's true. I I I mean, without being a chef or anything, but I agree completely. I think so much inspiration just comes um, being exposed. Hundred percent. All over. Who've been your role models or mentors along the way? Um, I think um, I've taken inspiration from different people along the way, whether it's um, like Professor Tiru, who um, at, at, at the Vaksha, my alma mater in Manipal, to Chef Floyd. But I think for me, a personal uh, role model or mentor would be my dad. Uh, I think he's someone who uh, leads by example in a lot of ways and m- not so much uh, work-wise but more in terms of like how to live your life as an individual and uh, yeah. Great. Um, your definition of success? My definition of success is to um, evolve and grow and improve upon yourself to be in a better place today than you were yesterday. Very true. What would you your message be to young chefs coming into the profession? <laughs> um, be patient uh, and build up a lot of perseverance. Uh, don't jump the gun. Don't try to open your own restaurant by the age of 22 or 23. Um, like build your credibility, build your experience so that you can stick it out for the long term and uh, try and have fun with it. Wise words. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chef, for being on the show and I truly wish you the very best with the Locavore and everything else you have lined up for it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>